there's this period, you, you, you kind of get to the end of the first period and then um, you recruit Phil uh, and Steve Hackett shortly after that as well. Hmm. Um, we'd like to talk about both of them, just um, what they brought and did things change as, as a group as a result? Well, yes, obviously we, when Phil came um, initially, I mean, he was, was very apparent to us that he was a really good drummer, you know, had a fantastic sense of rhythm and stuff, which we were all a bit stiff, you know. I, um, um, Pete has a great idea of rhythm, but doesn't have a great sense of rhythm. <laughs> You know what I mean? He, he's very good at sort of understanding how it all works, but he can't really do it himself. Um, Mike and I are probably a little bit less, certainly in those days, a bit less good at that anyhow, you know. Uh, so, you know, with someone, someone who just, he just made so much difference suddenly, it was so easy to play with Phil, you know, and you didn't have to tell him what to do or anything. He would come up with his own things. And, um, you know, it was a very a, a sort of real, and he had a likeness as a personality too. He was... He could joke and stuff and everything, you know, much better than... We were very intense, the rest of us. And we were, you know, we were, could be funny, but we you know, sort of kind of very much in our own world. Um, and he was sort of someone from outside who could make us all laugh and everything. And we did that first bit, which is a four-piece, which was quite tough, I have to say. Um, but it, was, it taught me an awful lot because I tried to play as many of Ant's parts as I could. I, put, um, I had an electric piano going through a fuzz box and I did a lot of the guitar parts through that, which obviously didn't sound that great, but on some, it worked okay for some things. And so the idea of playing a, the organ part and the kid there, you know, trying to work out what was important, what I could leave out of the organ part and play the, the, uh, the, 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 that part as well. And obviously Mike had to adapt a bit more as well, you know, to sort of try and fill in some of those gaps. And, um, you know, it was quite a frustrating time and it was quite difficult. Um, the writing sessions, I mean, which you talked about before, where we used to... Uh, I would. I remember storming out of, of when we were rehearsing one place. So that his first time with Phil, and uh, you know, I, I was I was very bullshit in those days, anyhow. And, and uh, you know, it just must have been very difficult for him. I think I was amazed he stayed. <laughs> if I'd been already gone, I think, because Peter and I used to fight a lot, very close friends, but you know, used to argue about silly little things, and um, we had quite a few there. But after you know, the, as I said, the four piece was was an interesting period, and and then we got. Um, we, we all kept auditioning for guitarists, but Mike, you know, was probably not the man to do it because he was looking for a place from France. So it ended up being more uh, other people. We got this. We tried this guy Mick Barnard, who had been suggested to us by someone who was, you know, imaginative guitarist and was good, but just wasn't really quite there. We felt just didn't have quite a strong enough personality to be part of the group. So, you know, Peter and I we responded to this ad in Melody Maker of a guy saying he was, you know, looking to do something slightly different went to see and that was Steve and we thought you know some of what he did would fit really well with him what we did we liked his approach he wasn't after didn't want to be a fantastic he was a very accomplished guitarist without wanting to be a sort of a, a flash guitarist at all you know and he was interested in sort of combinations and all the rest of it so it was uh, you know he was he was a, a great addition for us I think he had a slightly more of the classical edge to him you know which he introduced into Genesis slightly um, and what we found was very much that with, with Steve and I that we used to do a lot of stuff together in harmony, unison, or just playing off each other with lead lines. And, you know, this would work. I mean, something like, um, you know, you've got a piece like Musical Box, for example, where we'd alternate a bit. He'd do one solo and I'd do another solo, and that would work quite well. And then you get these moments like, the, let's say, Los Endos, where we played very much in harmony all the way through, we sort of worked through these parts. We did a lot of that, a lot of that on the lamb and stuff as well. And it just used to work really well. I think we both liked to think about it. We, were tended, we didn't really do sort of improvised solos. We tended to write instrumentals. And um, obviously you get there by improvising, don't get me wrong, but you, you sort of, when you actually go on stage, you've got a written part. And if you're playing in harmony with each other and the chords are changing quite a lot, you can't really improvise doing that. So it produced um, some really good moments. I, think, I mean, in, you know, Los Endos being one of the best examples of the thing where we, we sort of duetted very well, I thought. And... Uh, you know, it also meant Mike was able to become, I mean, he always was a rhythm guitarist, and he's a really good rhythm guitarist. I think that's sort of, people underestimate the power of a rhythm guitar, you know. Um, you talk about guitarists, you tend to think of sort of, you know, whether it's Hendrix or Clapton or Jeff Beck or whatever, all great musicians. But there's a, what a rhythm guitarist can do is something completely different, I think, you know, and you get some people like 
I mean, all the riffs and everything you hear on pieces, but he was just really good at setting up um, a kind of mood. And he didn't want to be a lead guitarist, really, at that stage, Mike, at all. So he could lay down a basis, either on using bass or using guitar, uh, which the, you know, Steve or I could, could do stuff on top of, if you like. And uh, that was was really good. And I think, you know, as I said, because Steve wasn't really so interested in the rhythms for that of it, it gave Mike the real chance to explore that and, you know, could really develop as a rhythm player. Did, was there um, an easy settling into this this new kind of band, a new relationship? Uh, well, I think we had seniors and juniors, definitely, really. Um, you know, th th I mean, they'd be the first to say, mention, I think, both Phil and Steve were not kind of, you know, uh, the, the opinions of Mike, Peter and I carried more weight, if you like, and we got our, we got our sort of ideas through more often, uh, certainly as writers. Phil at that point really didn't do much writing, so it didn't worry him too much. It worried Steve more, I think, because he had more writing ideas, but some of the stuff we really didn't feel felt. The rest of it didn't really want to do, it didn't fit with what we did. We tried to pick the areas that we liked a lot, and he did come up with some great stuff, you know. Um, you know, particularly with Can You Did It in the Coastliners in the early days, and then things like uh, Blood on the Rooftops later on. You know, some wonderful moments we could use and make really good use of, I think. But there were other things we weren't quite so into, which, you know, he liked. Um, so, you know, that must have been a bit frustrating for him, I think. Uh, and I think it was only after... I mean, Steve was sort of starting to become a kind of senior, if you like, by the time he left. And then he left. Oh, it surprised me. He left at a strange moment, I think. Um... In terms of a, as a player and a, and a sort of ranger, Phil was kind of pretty much got in there fairly fairly fast, I think, but not as a writer until, you know, 1980 or after Face Value, when he started to get his confidence as a writer going a bit more. So, um, yeah, I mean, so that's... I think they contributed less, to, less as writers and much more as players. They made it sound like a professional group, which we didn't really sound like in the early days. In a sense, it was kind of the first time you'd got um, full-blown professionals in with you, um, thinking of, like, Phil had done this sort of work, working on other people's albums, he's sort of slogged around. Mm. Um, he hadn't done so much at the time, I suppose. And to be honest, John Mayhew had come out of a group called Steamhammer, who had been sort of, a, you know, done the circuit a bit. So he, he'd been around a little bit. So he was brought in as a professional. But, you know, Phil was a very adaptable player and I think as dr most drummers are they sort of can do more than one thing I mean if they're really good drummers like that so he was able to any frustrations he felt with having to play with us if you like he could take out by playing with other people particularly in the more jazz rock area which he loved you know um, so you know it's sort of I can't what I was going to say now okay so I'm stopping <laughs> Let, let's, good job let's, if you want <laughs> let's uh, let's move on from that but, um, Musical Box um, on Nursery Crime, right? It, it's uh, now when we see it on uh, the, you know the old tapes played live. There's Peter in you know, full theatrical performance there mm. with, them, with all the different stages of it and so on. It's fantastic, but clearly at that point when you were writing it, it you didn't envisage it that way at all. Um, it wasn't. It wasn't that you wrote it in order for it to be a theatrical performance? No, no, it wasn't at all. I mean, we kind of, it's, it was a piece of the music we'd had around for a bit, actually, um, which Mike, uh, they knew what st the start of it, a thing that Mike and Ant had been working on, and we used it as an instrumental bit in some uh, music for a potential BBC programme that never got shown. Um, and it was it also was a nice bit, we wanted to make more of it, you know, so we used two of the bits in that as the basis for it and wrote a melodic line on top of it. And then, you know, it sort of started to want to go other places and we tried other things and, and all these sort of things happened, I suppose. And, you know, the idea of we having done stagnation, which had been sort of like gone through various different moods, this, we wanted to do something along those lines, but perhaps with a bit more sort of meat to it. It was not a very conscious thing. We just, at that stage, we were quite happy for songs to go on for a long time. We liked that, you know, so we did. And, um, you know, went through two or three quite contrasts again between the quiet bit and the loud bit and everything. And then this very serene ending, which was kind of a bit of a fluke, really. Um, Mike just started playing these two chords on the, on the guitar, like that, ding, ding, and I started playing these chords on top of it, um, which sort of was like a fugue thing, really. 
and it just sounded you know it was very triumphant sort of sort of had a sort of uplifting glorious quality about it and again like i said before with supper's ready um i originally saw it as an instrumental piece you know totally instrumental of course then pete starts he's got, got a story i've got a story to tell i've got to start singing so he starts singing on top of what i've written i think you're ruining it you're ruining it you know um but then you sort of start thinking, well actually this is sounding really good you know and after all when you play a chord sequence and uh, and you know it became that sort of last bit there you know, stand there with your fixed expression that sort of whole bit i think became you know the real high point i think from that from that album and you know sends shivers down your spine when you hear it the way it sort of just builds and builds and builds to this sort of kind of pseudo classical ending if you like which was fun to do so it's kind of where it starts and where it ends i suppose it's it's the real key of that song some of the middle stuff you know is, could have been different but the beginning and the end are crucial do you think um, it's a whole other experience seeing the, the theatrical side when Peter's in full costume? Well, I don't think so. I mean, the story was, just, was always there, and he just was acting out the story. And I think when we first, the first time he ever wore a costume on that was obviously with the uh, uh, infamous time in, in, the, in Dublin in the boxing ring where he came on in the red dress from the album cover. It's actually his, his wife, Jill's dress. In fact, he came on and, with the fox's head on, you know. And... He hadn't told us about it, which is just as well, because we'd never let him do it. Um, and it was just, you know, playing the thing, oh, God, you know, what's going on here? Um, and as we said before, this also got us on the front page of Melody Maker, so we thought, well, this, this is OK. Anyhow, after that, having done that, he decided, you know, once he got into the idea of doing this sort of thing, the idea, obviously, of actually playing the role of the person in the song, who's a sort of, obviously, a young child who gets prematurely old, and so he comes on as this, in this old man's mask, which is actually really spooky, and it really worked very well, that. Just simple lighting. Audience not expecting it the first time. He comes out as an old man and thinks, saying, who's this guy, you know? And sings this bit. And I think it's very moving, you know? And so it, it just enhances what the song already has. We've always tried to do that with visuals right through to the present day. You, not to slap something on, not just use lasers because you've got them or whatever, you know? You try and make it part of the song. So you try and get the builds and sometimes the sort of lyrical content to be illustrated by what you're doing and, and I think Musical Box was sort of the first time we really did that successfully and, and it was very simple and, and that came obviously from Peter and was very effective. And by the time it came to the Foxtrot um, you obviously had picked up a following I mean you know mm. the slogging around the country in the in the baker's van you kind of moved on a bit and you got a manager. We got a transit van now. Yeah, yeah. and you got Tony Stratton Smith involved as yeah. well. Um, was this? Would you like to talk a little bit about uh, that that period and about him? Well, yes. I think what you're looking for in those early days, you know, you must not say not selling any records. You're not really selling any concert tickets, and you're not really making any money, but you are sort of keeping afloat, I suppose. You're looking for people who to have some enthusiasm in you, some somebody who likes you, you know. And the thing with Tony Stratton Smith, we were played with this group, Rare Bird, who we actually were big fans of, anyhow. And they, he said that their manager, Tony Stratton Smith, was starting up this label, Charisma, and maybe he'd be interested for the label. And so we thought, well, OK, that sounds interesting. So he, he came, well, first of all, Rare Bird's producer, John Anthony, came along, and then later on, um, Tony Stratton Smith came along with him, and, and he really liked it already. At least he really saw potential for it on his label. Only were four acts on the label point. I mean, well, three at that point, I think. It was Van der Ruff Generator, Linda's Farm, Rare Bird and us. And, uh, and then he added audience and one or two other groups later on, you know. So it was, you know, we, and he, they took a personal interest in it, if you like. Um, I don't think the rest of the company were quite so sure. There was a guy there called Fred Munt who had no idea what we were about. He, he, you know, he would, like a lot of people, actually, <laughs> who really don't like the band. You know, if you don't like the band, you really don't like it. Some, you know, it's that kind, of, that kind of band. And he didn't. But, he, you know, he did the job and he was, you know, he was a friendly sort of chap. Quite funny. So he did the job. So he was acted as kind of various sort of tour manager and various sort of things in, for us in those early days. But Strat believed in us, and particularly, I think he really liked um, Foxtrot. You know, Nursery Crime we did for him first of all, and then Foxtrot was very much. Obviously, Trespass was also done, but Trespass was a little bit different. I think he, he got into all that um, and was always behind us, really, and, and just that enthusiasm, someone who really liked what you did. The group, the business was full of enthusiasts in those days. So uh, he was not a professional 
in a sense. He didn't. He wasn't a record company man at all. He was someone who spent far too much money on all the wrong things. You know, he supported groups that I don't know. I mean, Lindisfarne made him money. It was luck, I think. Um, I don't think Van de Graaff or us ever did much for him really. Most of the time we were with him. So he, he was a very he was very important to us, and we liked to be told. If you were feeling down and you had a Duff concert and things like that, he'd come out and say, you're wonderful, I love you, you know, and so you make you feel fantastic. You need guys like that. Which is one of the extraordinary things which I think a lot of contemporary groups might find kind of difficult to believe. We had no record company interference at all. We gave them the result every time. That's all they got. Um, later years, we even told them what the single was. We didn't play them the rest of the album, you know. I mean, we were able to do that. Incredibly lucky, I think. Because I don't think people, you know, the idea of 26-minute songs and everything would have not appealed to most. I mean, that particular record company did want it, of course, so it was fine, but it wouldn't really appeal too much to kind of your modern record company. And, um, you know, they just let us get on with it, really. It was, they backed us, they um, gave us the money to do what we wanted. We didn't really realise it was all future, against future earnings, so we didn't pay it back for many years. But it was, you know, at least they were there, and, and if we'd had split up at that moment, we wouldn't have owed a penny, so it was... It was pretty good. Um, I want to ask this question, and I haven't had an answer on it yet from anyone. Is why, uh, Selling England by the pound was actually a slogan of the Labour Party in 73, mm. I think. It's kind of around the, the, the time of the potential. It was Ted Heath and yeah, the, there was going to be a Labour like Party that. election. Mm. Yeah. And why was that used as the title? It was Peter's idea. It came in the song. Dancing with the Moonlit Night uh, as, a, as a phrase in there and we just thought it's a fantastic phrase and it, we should use it as a title, you know. Um, it wasn't particularly supposed to be, you know, it's a bit like you just a phrase you hear and you, you use it. It's, it's, um, it's like Pete used Games Without Frontiers as a title as one of his songs but it was nothing to do with it's a knockout you saw on TV or even the, the charity group, you know, it's just a good phrase that he felt kind of could work and I think that's how it was with, with that really, it just sounded good and it, I think it represented so much, it was so good as to what we were trying to do, you know, we were a very English group trying to make it in the world, if you like, and so we were sort of selling, selling ourselves, really. Um, uh, so that's, and Peter might have more profound things to say on it, on it than that, but that's my memory of it, and you know, it's, it's still one of the best titles we've, we've had, I mean, I know it came from somewhere else, but it's still a great title. No, I think it's a fantastic title. And uh, the idea of the the very English group mm. sort of links back to um, something I was trying to get at, but maybe we'll have another another dig at this, is, uh, <clears throat> you know, songs like The Musical Box, um, where you've got a kind of mixture of the English nursery rhyme and the, the, the kind of... Um, the tradition, English tradition in there, and there's, a, and there's a sort of pastoral thing running through as well. All that comes in. Um, is, that, is that because it, it reflects you guys and where you came from and, you know, your, your sense of, I mean, you, you, like, you like to live in the country, or is it, is it just something that's coming from you very directly, I'm wondering? Well, I'm not one to answer that. I'm pre presumably, yes. I have no idea. It's not something ever a conscious thing. It's just what appealed to us. And what we did, um, it just seemed to come out in this sort of English kind of way. I said in our influences, you know, with the sort of folky influences and other things, we we're probably more. We we like to take influences from elsewhere as well. I mean, we've mentioned some of the American acts that we liked. I mean, Peter and I particularly were very keen on American soul music. You know, I mean, Otis Redding. You know, I just love the way that I love the soulful voice on kind of quite a lush backing. You know, you think it's like I put a spell on you by Nina Simone is just archetypal of that. You've got this, you know, very almost classical sort of string sound in the background with this very sort of, you know, soulful moving voice on top of it. And I love that combination of Peter obviously had that kind of voice. So really liked that kind of thing when we could use it. And we did it a lot. I mean, from looking for someone onwards, really, we were doing that. Um, that's the first song on Trespass. Trespass. Yeah, that comes out very strongly. It's like such a clear, soulful voice. It's quite startling. When you well, I think that's, you know, that's why we wanted to start the album with it. I mean, Pete never sang, you know, on that. It was far and away the best singing on that album. It just sounded great. And the version we used was actually the thing he did on the, on the rough mix, his verse, his singing. Pretty much used that. Cause it just sounded so good. Um, you know, the song. And it, it, it's sort of 
sort of set a certain area of where we wanted to, to kind of be, I suppose. And the Englishness, I think, came more, perhaps more from the Guattari things in a way initially, things like White Mountain and Dusk, are sort of, they sort of feel very English, I think. Um, the other thing we tended to do a little bit, I suppose, was, it's a curious thing, but some of the early Genesis music was very definitely intended not, not to swing. That's a kind of strange thing, that, but um, I was talking to some guys later on, some American guys, some one of these jazz rock groups, something. They, they wanted to know how you did that, because <laughs> they'd all been taught up. Everything had to swing. It was a thing. So everything's got that little bit of something about it. If you want a thing to be totally square, sometimes that really works well. I mean, you do a song like, well, Squonk, obviously, we're trying very hard to do that. But even if you go back to things like um, Firth of Fifth, it's very straight. There's no kind of hint at sort of, and that's quite English as well. Because the American stuff that we loved, you know, whether you're talking about sort of Tamla or whatever, that's all got that swing to it, you know. Uh, so whereas the English groups were, were happier to perhaps be a bit squarer. You know, Beatles often were quite square, I think, and, 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 the, and the Kinks and all that sort of stuff. And they were the sort of big influences on us. It, it's, it's difficult to know, you know, why. I can hear it that we sound English, but I don't quite know. We, there was no conscious attempt to do that. That's just how it was. Um, interesting you mentioned Firth of Fifth. Uh, Daryl um, talked about talk, talked to us about the the kind of having to relearn in a way a particular style of mm. guitar playing, and, and I, I imagine it ties in with what you're saying that that the uh, there isn't a, isn't swing in that, and he's mm. kind of he's an American musician who's well, it's partly that I think I mean Daryl is a complainer thing, you know, he's an incredibly versatile musician, brilliant musician, really. So he has to sort of fit into a certain style for the for the piece, you know. Now, when we wrote Firth of Fifth, you know, and Steve obviously played the guitar solo on that, he was quite a, you know, quite a stiff player, particularly in those days. Certain kind of effect. I mean, it's very much a melodic line you're playing with Firth of Fifth, the main guitar solo, and then you improvise a little bit around it. There's little moments, obviously, you can do a bit more, but it's a very strong thematic moment, and you can't not play that. You can't sort of think, well, it's a nice chord sequence. I'll do this. You can do a bit of it, but you've got to mainly stick to the, stick to it because it's just, it's as written as, as any melody in any other part of the song. So it's, um, you know, that's. I think is uh, you know it's, it, it turned into a very strong moment, a stronger moment than we probably ever thought it was going to be when we first did it. You know, originally I'd written this piece just for flute and piano, as is how you hear it earlier on in the song. And it was Steve's idea, he said, look, let's just, just try it a bit bigger. You, you know, let's go for it, you know. I'll play guitar and play the, the Mellotron. And so I did this, and it just suddenly it was, you know, it was, took it into sort of like King Grimson zone a bit, I suppose. But, you know, I think it became something else because the, the melodic, the guitar was so strong, that melodic line. I never thought it would work on a guitar. Put it like that, it's such a classical, you know, the little rundown is so classical. I thought it would never work on a guitar, but it just sounded great. And... Um, and, you know, became sort of one of the high points on that album, Selling England. And it's something you played live? And, uh, well, we played that bit of it. Normally the two instrumental bits, which were probably the two strongest bits of it, the keyboard solo, which gave me a bit of a party piece, I suppose. Um, I know a lot of pianists who use it as their party piece. <laughs> and if you go on to YouTube, you'll find hundreds of people playing it. It's just one of those things, I don't know. Um, they can all play it better than me, I'm sure, because when I... I stopped playing it live. I had a, we were playing in um, Drury Lane. We had a residency there for about four or five days. And on, I think it was the second or the third day, I used to start first fifth with the piano part. But I had to play it on an electric piano. Uh, in those days, electric pianos were pretty basic things. Uh, this RMI piano, which had no touch sensitivity and didn't have a full, full keyboard. So I used to play it and it didn't sound that great, but it was, people wanted to hear it, so I did it. And one time I was playing it and it's, I was quite enjoying myself and I went up and I started playing it and I started playing it like I played on the album. It went up, no keys. So it was that moment you think. <laughs> so I just threw my hands up in the air like that and the rest of the band look at me like this and, they, and Phil goes, three, four, and they go into the song. And so, I mean, after that, I also, because I felt it was kind of like after we'd done the, for the next tour, we didn't do it obviously on the... Lamb talks, we didn't do any of those songs. When it came to Trick of the Tale, we wanted to do the song, but we did it without the, without the introduction. It just sort of seemed a little bit self-indulgent. But it was, uh, but anyhow, the keyboard, the version with the synthesizer and drums and everything, which was always quite exciting. A certain element of the audience loved that kind of stuff where everything, we've it's like, 
real band play, orchestra stuff, you know, you, every, the drums, everybody's doing their own thing, it's very important, every beat has to be hit, and it, you know, quite complicated, and it, it excites some people, you know, that's where they're going to have a pee, but other people, that's them, the, the high point. So that, combined with the very serene and much more straightforward guitar solo afterwards, used to be the two bits of that song that survived right through to the end. Maybe it's a point to talk about you and Mike, um, and the, kind of the generation, the, the generating of this kind of what I call the engine of Genesis, you know, which which is there in um, the early stages, but then it's there in in your final record. You know, you can th that sort of sound that is well on under... calling all stations. There was no one else, so it, it had to be just us, didn't right. it? Really? <laughs> Prior to calling all stations. Um, you know. Yeah, I think we sort of used to have this way of working, you know, particularly building up a sound, which, I mean, I mean, obviously we mentioned the Apocalypse 9-8, and obviously Cinema Show would be another one, the, the, set, the last second half of Cinema Show. I mean, a lot of this involved Phil anyhow, who's very much there, but the kind of way you sort of... Mike's very good, as a rhythm guitar, very good setting up kind of rhythms and things on the things, and I would play chords on top of it, Try and do as much as I could with whatever he'd set up. If he was on one chord, you know, something, you know, there's so much I could do, and I'd push it somewhere else, try to, and then after a bit, he'd come along and join me on that new new note, you know. And and you'd sort of get an effect, really. It was a fun way of doing it. It was, it's great to have people, not everyone want to play lead all the time, you see. I think if you've got some guitarists, particularly once by the time we're down to a three piece, you know, would just want to play lead all the time. And he always wanted to play rhythm or bass, really. And the lead would come later. I mean, a couple of times the lead line was important, but and so you ended up with this kind of combination of of the two of us being very crucial, I think, to 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 the things, particularly in later Genesis, I suppose. Um, you know, so sometimes I think sometimes things you didn't you didn't let them become what they were obviously going to become. I mean, I, take a song like Dodo, which you know, where there's a really great guitar riff in that, which could have been a disco hit, really. Uh, which is the verse, but kind of being how I am, and not really being so much into that kind of music, kind of did something with it that changed it a little bit and made it part of this sort of rather cumbersome sort of big, big song, dodo-like sort of song, you know, which I think was quite interesting and worked quite well, but it was different from what it could have been. You could have had a hit out in the middle of all the, the verse of that, I think. Um, but we didn't go that route. So, you know, we sort of, we act as sort of helpers and spoilers, for, for each other's bits sometimes, which is which is good, I think. That's that's sometimes you take things where you don't think they're gonna go and, and that can be quite exciting. Um, and I you know when we started writing Trick of the Tale and Steve wasn't there because he was still doing his solo album, that sort of first moment when we started doing that opening of um Dance in the Volcano, you know, it just was such a key moment that really we sort of Mike was playing guitar so I was playing these chords and I didn't play slightly less obvious chords than the ones that were suggested by the the riff you know and it just suddenly that was Genesis it was a whole thing you know it became something and we knew we were on on a way you know you just sort of the key moment to, to give you the confidence that you could do this um, it wasn't going to just be a combination of solo songs although they were very important on that album it was going to be group stuff that would be able to you know um, be something very different and I think Volcano particularly and then later Los Endos which came um, were the two sort of key tracks from that point of view. <laughs> 